If you come across this land and you don't see Jesus, it was only a tour. I'm a follower of Jesus, and as a pastor in Brooklyn, New York, I want to see him from a fresh point of view. So I'm embarking on a journey to six vastly different countries all around the world. We're the most extreme nation in the world when it comes to these values. Every culture I've encountered has revealed something unique about the character of Jesus. We need to begin to look out for each other. And shown me the limitations of my own way of seeing things. That's a that loaded question. I'm ready to discover, to be challenged, all with the hope of knowing Jesus more. I'm Russell Berry, and I'm in pursuit of Jesus. If you've been traveling along with me on this series, you already know that I can't just go to a new country without trying the local delicacies. And since all I know about Swedish cuisine involves red chewy candy fish, local guide and food expert Jessica stepped up to expand my Swedish culinary awareness. These are things I have never seen before. I know, I've never seen I this know. anywhere. <laughs> Nobody like, has. What would you recommend? In I this would herring? recommend pickled herring, which is the thing. All right, so here we go. That's good. It's a good one. Huh? Yeah, gotta confess. Mm -hmm. I was a little scared. When you I was, were. Yeah, <laughs> I was a little nervous, yeah. but I like it. It reminds me of potato salad. Yeah. Mm. Pickled herring. I can't say I woke up this morning with a desire to eat fish from a can. Sweden is known for its sensible, practical approach to pretty much everything. Maybe this is a result of living in a place with such long, dark winters. And even though the Swedish population of 10 million enjoys some of the highest quality of life rankings in the world, when you live this close to the Arctic Circle, sometimes you have to make practical decisions, like eating fish out of a can. That's good. Now right. we have to pause. Okay. We take the glass, mm -hmm. and whoever's sitting beside us or around the table, you have to look in their eyes. Yep. So we do like this. And there's a song that goes like this. I'll d just take it short. Sure. Yo, I love how food reveals culture, how gathering around the table speaks to what is important to people. As I struggle to learn the song's lyrics, what strikes me most about this tradition is the moment Swedes take to pause and look at the person to the left or right. <laughs> <laughs> It'll get better each time. Yes. <laughs> it's an acknowledgement of each person as important, fully present, valued. Everyone matters. Sweden is a very special and very particular nation in the world. It's a beautiful country, isn't it? From the very north and the, the Arctic climate and down to the south, which is almost continental. It's a beautiful nation. Pear, like most Swedes, has an affinity for nature. But unlike most Swedes, he's made it his career to study the social and cultural trajectory of his nation. Sweden is both very secular and very individualistic. The autonomy of the individual has become the, the focus of all things in Sweden. You oppose things that, that are common in other cultures. Community is not so important in Sweden. They also rebel against authority per se. Authority is always considered as something negative and dangerous. And thirdly, against the sacred God himself, because he is the highest authority and the highest community that you may enter into and the, that the individualistic forces would rebel against. We're the most extreme nation in the world when right. it comes to these values. Pear's perspective is backed up by statistics. In the World Values Survey, Sweden is tied with Japan as the two most secular individualistic nations in the world. I wonder how much this individualism is a reaction to a history of religious conformity. 300 years ago, Lutheranism was the only denomination allowed in Sweden, and Sunday Mass was mandatory. Jesus has been part of Swedish culture for a thousand years now. 
but still, the last century of secularization has sort of moved people away from who Jesus is, and a lot of people have created an alternative Jesus. So the Jesus figure that is often presented in modern Sweden is the one who is not authoritarian and okay. allows me to say that I want this part of Jesus, but this part of Jesus that is about being the Lord, I can reject him. To most observers, the church in Sweden is dead or dying. Though the State Church of Sweden lays claim to 57% of the population as members, fewer than 10% attend any kind of church services other than weddings and funerals. This is stunning, since only 70 years ago it was illegal to leave the church for an unstated reason. As a pastor, I believe the church can be a source of goodness and love offering a place of refuge and hope to society. But I have also experienced that sometimes that hope is hard to see. So I wonder, how will I see Jesus reflected in this Nordic country? Lars pastors a small church of multi-ethnic believers in the suburbs of Stockholm. As we approach the church building in Husby, I hope to begin to understand the backdrop for the sudden and sweeping secularization of Sweden. Between 1850 and 1950, there were revivals in Sweden. Before this was only state church exercising authority over people. To be a Christian didn't really mean to be free. It meant more restrictions and sort of being under something. And because freedom is something that we value so much, the Christian faith didn't offer that to common people. So they wanted to do away with the yoke of Christianity. Before coming to the suburban community, Lars spent more than a decade as a missionary in Alexandria, Egypt. That experience uniquely prepared him for his work today with the influx of refugees from the Middle East to Sweden. Lars gave me a glimpse into some of the quirky, endearing cultural differences between Sweden and Egypt. There's a funny story when me and my wife, we wanted to have some privacy, being Swedes. And it was wintertime and the beaches in Alexandria, they are empty winter time. So we went there, it was a nice sunny day. We had our two kids with us and the beach was truly empty, there was no one there. And we thought, wow, this is wonderful. Then we saw this Egyptian family coming, you know, far away, so no problem. This is like a kilometer of beach, what's the problem? Of course, they came closer and closer and all the way up to us, they put the blankets beside ours. <laughs> And we said, what is this, you know? We, we didn't know actually how to handle the situation. But when you think about it, it was really beautiful what they did, you know? They wanted to say, welcome to our country. Mm -hmm. We want to be your friends. If you want to share our food, you're welcome. Wow. Now this is very Egyptian. Yes. And very Swedish. <laughs> <laughs> From the time you left Egypt to now, there's been a significant amount of refugees that are here. What has been the primary reaction to that reality in Sweden? in Sweden? The incredible phenomenon has happened in Sweden that there are converts from Islam all over the country. I'm traveling now from north to south, and wherever I go, I meet converts from Islam to Christianity. And Swedes maybe don't understand what's going on, but this is something that God sort of back door <laughs> could get to the Swedes and said, what do we believe? I mean, we're Swedes, but what do we believe? There are many good things about Swedish culture. I mean, we just love to be out in nature, to share with the birds and the flowers. I mean, we just love it. And for me as a Christian, of course, I see God, the creator in all of this. Instead of the weekly visit to cathedrals of stone and stained glass, you'll find Swedes seeking the beauty of nature. I've previously visited Singapore, a place described as a city in a garden, beautifully manicured and precisely measured. 
Swedes, on the other hand, appreciate more of an organic, natural beauty. They often retreat to the countryside, and with 97% of the country uninhabited, there's a vast terrain to explore and enjoy. To see this up close, I'm headed north, to the land of the midnight sun. Eighty miles above the Arctic Circle is the small lakeside village of Shawajis. This is my growing forest. What's the value for you of planting these trees? Like? I don't plant them. I oh. just let them grow. So they uh, just decided to plant them. They decide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I let let the nature decide. <laughs> yeah, I'm is. just here to. Uh, um, maybe I can take away one and to give another one more space. I begin my trek visiting Daniel Wixland, a recognized master of Swedish folk music with a zeal for nature, who makes his home in the scenic countryside. I didn't know if it was summer or winter, so I put the sandal. I'm breaking all the, the <laughs> etiquette, but now I'm home. I can do whatever I want to. Here, Daniel not only practices his royally awarded folk music, but he also built and maintains his own house in concert hall. And we continue on the Strand de Promenaden. Strand de Promenade. Like most Swedes, Daniel is not particularly religious. However, he is motivated by a powerful desire to connect with people, which I would say is kind of odd, since we're in the middle of nowhere. It's a different way of life, even if you compare to southern Sweden. I mean, for you to create this space, it seems like you have a real value for community. Exactly. I work with people. I want to touch people somehow make them think or laugh or cry. Mm. I guess it uh, has something to do with our, everybody's need mm. to reflect ourselves because we're all, we all belong together. Yes. Actually, this is, a, this is not a normal thing. <laughs> this, I'm the only guy in this village who does this. Maybe because of being who I am, yeah. I've always been a dreamer. I was sitting in the back seat in the car. My father was driving, my brother was looking at the map, and the radio was telling us the weather that we were missing somewhere else. And I was dreaming away with the weather report. So that's maybe my superpower, that I'm uh, <laughs> always longing for something. That's a core cool superpower. But I think that we all, we all have it. Yeah. Daniel invited me to hike up a mountain that was literally in his Shire-like backyard. Curious to learn more about his love for nature and keeping an eye out for hobbits and elves, I decided to take him up on it. So this mountain to me means a lot. It was my last moment with my brother when he was just about to die from cancer. Mm. And uh, I asked him, so brother Rickard, where do you want to meet me? And this is when he's in the hospital. Yeah, yeah, he is. And, uh, and he doesn't answer me. And I said, can you hear me? Of course I can hear you. Said, but why don't you answer me then? Well, I'm too busy with other stuff thinking. I can't think about those things right now. So what are you thinking about? I'm trying to survive, he said. Mm. But I'm sure that if he was uh, clear yes. and uh, yeah. healthy, he, I, I imagine that I meet him on the mountain. Because I remember him as a strong and healthy person. Once a year, you're coming here. A snap. As Daniel and I walked, as I joined him on his journey, the beauty of creation that Jesus spoke into being reminded me that life is just not supposed to end this way. Jesus promised us there's more. Fly a toast for you, my friend. Faith, expectations, dream of another life. North and south, fly. A toast for you, my friend, and a solo. Right. Woo! Nice. I like it. It's my favorite song, actually. It tells a lot about myself, who I, um, not who I am, but my longing for. Where does this, uh, this longing come from, this power? And what would happen that day, eventually, if I catch up with my own 
longing, because longing for something that you always have to run after. Even further north of Daniel's place is the traditional land of the Sami people, Lapland. The Sami were the original inhabitants of this land, and like many indigenous peoples, were exploited by rulers who used the veneer of religion to satisfy their own political and financial greed. Ida, a descendant of the Sami, explained the painful history of her people. So welcome into the Sami Museum. Thank you. We take a step into the Sami culture. I will learn you more about In the middle of the 16th century, Gustav I, the ruthless and ambitious founding king of Sweden, sent missionaries to Lapland. Unfortunately, his motivations were disturbingly self-serving and nefarious. Through his state church, Gustav imposed strict taxes and forced conversion to Christianity. In this way, he was able to control vast amounts of valuable land full of rich natural resources. He had heard about the wild animals, and the skins was very expensive, so he wanted to take control over the area. It was a big, big area. It was Lapland in Norway, Sweden, Finland, and a little bit of Russia. He forced the Sami people to come to the church, to pay taxes to him, and then they become Christians. So he forbid the Sami religion. I have a story from that time. It was a father, a Sami father, and his son, and the son was playing in a river, a small river and the son was coming under the water. And the father was trying to get the life back to the boy. He wanted to have help from the gods. And the people saw this, the other people, and they decided to burn him alive on fire because he was having the Sami religion. Wow. Mm. So that's why we lost it so fast. It was hard. What followed was a systematic suppression of Sami culture, religion, and identity. It became an embarrassment to speak the Sami language or keep the nomadic reindeer herding way of life. Despite the oppressive introduction, faith in Jesus eventually became a steadfast hope for the Sami people. So it's many special things that we had lost because of the new religion. You know, I find it interesting that even in the midst of how, you know, the awful ways that Christianity was introduced to the Sami people, mm -hmm. that people still believed in spite of how it was brought. Yes. Until now, my grandmother, that generation, was very hard, a strong believer in mm -hmm. Jesus. But today we had lost the connection to the church. Mm -hmm. So we only go to the church when it's a wedding, funeral. Okay. But only 50, 70 years ago, right. it was much stronger. We have often talked about it, that it's sad that when we go to the church and the priests are talking, it's difficult to understand what they are saying. We need a new way to communicate because we like to go to the church, but it's difficult to understand. Once time we had a very good priest, he was talking about the Bible and he said something about to borrow. If you have a snowmobile, do you borrow it to your friends? When you connect it with the modern life, then yes. you understand. So it feels like they have to do that. Yes. It's difficult for us to understand. Which style of living do you think Jesus lived closer to? The Sami way or the Western way? The Sami way. <laughs> don't take more than you need. Yeah. We borrow things because we don't have the needs to own things, to right. need the land because we borrow it. No one can own the land, my husband used to say. It's, it's crazy that people own lakes. Yeah. It's everyone. It's so crazy that it has been like this. Also, today we need the simple life because it's when you get the energy, you are here and now. We need it to sit like this, to have the fire. It's so important. Today we are proud to be a Sami. So my father is very proud that I took back the life that he couldn't have no. because his father was ashamed. He was 19 years old, his father, my grandfather. He bought a new last name. Wow to show I'm not a Sami, I'm a Swedish. So my father is very proud. He, I can see the happiness in his eyes when we have the rain there, when we have this kind of life. 
Jesus identified himself as the good shepherd. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. And it's like that. Yes, that's a, that's it's a, like a, the good reindeer herder. <laughs> The deep respect and reverence for nature I've experienced here in Sweden seems to infuse the water, the air, the people. I can't help but wonder if it was the influence of the Sami culture. And at the same time, the history of abuses of Christian expansion seems to have left a scar on this country, as most forced change does. But the natural beauty of this place has given me a sense of freedom and nearness to Jesus as the Creator. What a contrast to finding Jesus in the crush of the city, and His creation still calls to any who long to know Him. As I head back south to Stockholm, I'm struck with this thought, that Sweden, one of the most secular countries in the world, reveals Jesus in ways I have never seen. Back in Stockholm, I'm headed to Hammerby Kirken, a congregation of the State Church of Sweden. And Ahida Parsan is a remarkable Iranian woman whose harrowing story is chronicled in her autobiography, Stranger No More. She came to Sweden through Denmark, seeking refuge from an abusive husband and the systems in Iran that protected him. One of the things we have in common, my whole name is Rasul Amin Akbar Berry, right? When you say Rasul, I say, do you from Iran? <laughs> <laughs> Once in Denmark, she became a follower of Jesus. Then, after moving to Sweden, she followed a calling to become an ordained minister in the state church. Before I be a priest, I studied and I working. Uh, one consultant, some, uh, he come to me and say, uh, I heard about you, you want to uh, finish your job here and you want to go. Why? I say, I want to be a priest. I say, are you crazy? You have a car accident. Didn't happen to, to, to you. <laughs> Did you bump your, do you have a concussion? Did you bump your head? That was his thought. What is your hope for serving in the Church of Sweden as a minister? I like to work in here yes. because I know maybe church is died, but not Jesus. Mm. When Jesus come to uh, church, it's be life in the church. That's it, that's good. Okay? Yeah. Just now, I, I am not only a priest here, I am a missionary. A missionary. God sent me here to missionary for the Sweden. That's great. I want to go uh, that way to be ready for uh, help people in Sweden. I do, must you, do you see myself. the beautiful irony in God <laughs> sending a woman from Iran to come to Sweden to be a missionary to the Swedish people after a whole history of people from the West going all over yes. the world? And I said, just now I don't know why I am here, but I know my life is not for me. It's for, it is for Swedish people. Mm. It is for many people here in Sweden. They must wake up. I'm like John. Um, yes. I baptize people. Yes. Yes. It's my calling. Yes. And I preach and uh, baptize yes. people. How many, I don't know how many people I, uh, I baptize. <laughs> And Ahida's assertion that maybe the church has died, but not Jesus, is provocative. I can't help but wonder what the Swedes are really walking away from. Maybe from what they perceive church had become. A place of control, manipulation, a burden. But that was never what Jesus meant the church to be. The church is meant to be a community of Jesus' followers freely sharing his message of love and redemption with the world, serving humbly and living simply, yeah, like a good reindeer herder.
The wounds of this country are deep, yet I have seen glimpses of Jesus overcoming these wounds and transforming them into something beautiful. Could it be that in these desolate, dying places of the church, new life in Jesus will be found? Jesus is pursuing the Swedes. I have seen Jesus and Anahita and Lars's love for the people they serve, and the longings of Daniel and Ida for meaningful community, and in the Swedes' love of nature. And as I look at the beautiful expanse of this country, what I have discovered while pursuing Jesus in Sweden is that Jesus is in pursuit of us. Philosophy can fånga få mig att förstå. This is the life, yo. This is it, yo. Exactly. <laughs> you can have breakfast at night, mm. go for a swim in the morning, sleep at noon. You know, that's really similar to New York, too. I mean, it's, ah, yeah. it's, it's not the midnight sun, it's the, <laughs> it's the city that never sleeps. Yeah. And it's kind of the same way. Like, there's a freedom in that. I have a stone as a a pillow? A, a pillow. It works quite good. <laughs> Just put your head in you know the right why? position. Because you're a wild man. <laughs> I'm a wild man. Wild man. Yeah. <laughs>